Moments with Marianne. I'm so delighted we're spending this time here today. We have a very inspiring show coming right up. Our guest today is Jenny Lee, and she's here to talk to us about her new book, Breathing Love. Now, Jenny is a certified yoga therapist who has spent two decades coaching people in the healing traditions of classical yoga meditation. Using the practices she writes about in Breathing Love, Jenny helps people overcome grief, depression, anxiety, and stress, as well as create lives filled with greater joy. Jenny's writings have been featured in dozens of wellness blogs and in magazines, including The Huffington Post, Mind Body Green, Yoga Digest, and Yogi Times, just to name a few. So let's welcome to the show, Jenny. Thank you, Marianne. So happy to be here. Oh, it's such a pleasure to have you here. My goodness. And it's so delighted we get to spend time again together and you've got a great new book. How did this book, you know, even come into being? Well, I've been um, practicing meditation and yoga for a long time. And so much of that practice for me is not a physical practice, but it's really a, an internal um, mental and spiritual practice. And one of the aspects of it is not just the the meditation on the cushion, but it's really taking that meditation practice and living it. Um, how we practice that that essential energy of meditation in daily life, and so I really wanted to write a book that would help people understand the ways of doing this. And to me, love is the greatest. Uh, spiritual practice of all. And we, I'm sure we'll talk a lot more about that today. But um, mm-hmm. the concept really is that active conscious loving is the greatest spiritual practice that we can undertake. And I think our world certainly needs more of it right now. So <laughs> <laughs> for sure. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's so much upset in the world in different degrees that it's really you look at it, and you're like, wow, you know, it's easy to get kind of sucked into that as opposed to really kind of focusing, you know, in that, in that inner journey and not really allowing those things to kind of rock your boat. I think the inner journey and the outer journey have to be one and the same because we are interconnected. We live in this interconnected world. And that's one of the things that I think we need to recognize even more than maybe we are. And, You know, people are afraid, rightfully so, for a lot of different reasons. They're stressed out. And um, while the traditional practice of seated meditation is such a a wonderful anchoring and grounding practice for that inner journey, as you said, I feel like there's also that step of connecting more on the outside, recognizing our unity, and really breathing into that oneness that we all share and finding the ways of of rebuilding the connectivity that I think has gone missing in a lot of sectors in our our lives of late. Mm -hmm. Well, and for people that are looking to develop more of that love in their meditation practice and into their practice, um, how can they start, you know, putting increments of love in there? Because I know for some people it's really hard to get to that place when you see, you know, destruction happen or, There's some, you know, kind of angst and politics, regardless what side of the fence you're on. You know, there's a lot of different things that kind of keep people out of love. Yeah. And I think for me, the biggest step in that direction was when I realized that love already lives within me. And my job in meditation is to unblock the places in my mind and in my heart that keep me from recognizing that love that lives within the love energy that is who I truly am. And that who I believe that, that, you know, I believe everyone is. Um, So it's kind of turning the paradigm of love upside down. We think about getting love or attracting love. Um, You know, there's lots of books written about that. And Mm -hmm. this is not that this is saying, all the love we need is right within us, waiting for us to reconnect to it and discover it, waiting there for us as our intrinsic being. And so meditation for me is the way to do that because it's in the stillness 
that I cultivate through my daily meditation practice that I'm able to tap into that well of love so that then I can bring it out into my relationships and into my daily interactions. Yeah, and, and move it from there. Well, and I know in your book you talk about that that love and that search for that inner peace. What are some ways we can implement that? Well, uh, I think the first way is to recognize, again, the ways in which you may be blocking love. I just mm-hmm. actually received a message from a friend of mine this morning who said she was ordering the book and she was excited about it because she realized that she had been really um, preventing herself from experiencing loving relationships over the last several years. And usually that happens because we have been hurt in some way. We've been betrayed. We've been um, abandoned. We've been broken up with or something hasn't worked out in the ways in which we've wanted. So there's this um, distrust of what we perceive as love on the outside. And so, again, it's really um, recognizing the ways in which we have started to block the love that actually begins within and then attracts to itself of its same nature on the outside. But the the job is always within. You know, it's never about changing the other person or changing anything in the external world. I believe that our practices are always about changing ourselves and making ourselves more available towards the qualities that we are trying to cultivate. And so for me, the first step in doing that, to answer your question really, is to analyze, to be introspective and to analyze the ways in which we're blocking it. You know, for some people, it might be a resentment or an anger energy. And so there's chapters in the book that kind of deal with each one of those obstacles to love. And um, so it is, it's an interesting process. Well, uh, it's so great that you give those examples because I think sometimes people get stuck and like, well, I'm not sure what my block is. And having those examples gives people the opportunity to go, oh, you know, that kind of resonates. Maybe I need to sit with that for a little bit. Yeah, I feel like theory is great and (laughs) these concepts, especially when we get into Mm -hmm. really spiritual, esoteric concepts like love and inner peace and these words that float around, they all sound great, but then it's like bringing it back to the tangible. And I feel like that's one thing that I um, have tried to do in both of my books is yeah. give people exercises and tools and strategies to implement the theory. And in this book, I actually also share a personal story in each chapter to illustrate my journey through each theme and how I... Um, you know, to give an example of um, a way in my life in which I've worked through the different obstacles to love and um, how that's really changed things. I mean, it's changed uh, some relationships really miraculously. Yeah, to move things in a, in a different direction. Yeah, you because know, I know in your book you talk about the way out is is in. And so a lot of people are going, wow, you know, how can I even do that? You know, because I'm just trying to struggle with the things that I'm being confronted with. Well, the only way to to deal with the things you're being confronted with is to have an anchor that is a foundation of that you can step off from. So mm-hmm. if, if you're if you're trying to do a a, a good jump, you're not gonna, you're going to jump much better from a hard surface than from a slidey surface. So we have to give ourselves those spiritual practices that give us the foundation within that makes us strong, that gives us the um, the real sense of what we are committed to. And um, there's a, a chapter in the book that talks about these inner commitments and identifying for ourselves. What is the highest principle having to do with love that we can state and affirm for ourselves as kind of that that guiding philosophy for our life? And so one of the ones for me that's really strong, and this is a a common one, is to not make choices from fear, but always make my choices from love. And if we watch how we interact with people or how we make decisions, oftentimes we're trying to strategize and sort of manipulate the situation because we're afraid of a certain thing happening. So we're making a choice 
around that fear. And I have just found that that never works out for my highest good or anyone else's. And that although sometimes initially the choice based on love it may feel more difficult, in the long run, it always plays out as the best choice. Mm-hmm. It really gives people at least a, a place to be, for, like a like a home base or starting point. So that way they can kind of always recorrect, uh, reconnect to that inner love and move forward even when they're in situations where they're not really feeling maybe very loving or they're going through a tough time. It allows them that core that they can reconnect with. Right, and this is an interesting distinction because the feeling of love that we associate as as what love is is, is mm-hmm. often not really what love is. It, the feeling of love is sort of an emotional wave that moves through us um, at different times and with different people, but it's not necessarily that sustaining energy of love that is above and beyond any personal context or connection. And that's what we're trying to get to in the book. And so there's a lot of explanation about the difference between personal love and universal love and how we can move our experience of loving from the personal place, which is very limited and very based on our our individual stories, into this place of more universal loving, divine loving, that is connected to the energy of which we are all a part. And to me, that's really the essence of meditation, of meditation practice. I mean, I know there's a lot of different approaches and intentions that people take to their meditation Mm -hmm. practice. But for me, it really is that. It's about remembering and reconnecting to that unified state of consciousness that is based in love. It means so much because I know when people are going through anxiety or stress, sometimes it could feel like it's difficult to make that connection but over time, when you practice and you talk, you know, your book gives such great examples in how to get there, you know, it, it, it becomes a, a simple, you know, kind of a simple way to kind of tap in. Yeah, and this is a lifetime journey. I mean, it's not like do 10 practices and you're all set. <laughs> it's not seven-minute abs. I get it. <laughs> <laughs> all right, 10 minutes to perfect love, right? Yes. We will buy that app. <laughs> yeah. But, um, but I must say the, the practice does get easier, you know, where at first it has to be a very conscious thing and you have to really work at the discipline of bringing your thought back to that that consciously loving place and to con- bring yourself back to the choices that are based in love and not fear. And um, over time, as you do it, it becomes more habitual and more innate. And so it gets a bit easier. So just like working out the body, mm-hmm. working out the mind and the spirit also does get easier with, with, continued practice. And that's one thing that people really, I think, get thrown off on about meditation practice is they hear all these great benefits and they think, great, I'm going to do this. I'm going to meditate. And they sit down and try it for 10 minutes for a couple of days and think, I'm not getting anything out of this. Like, what is even happening? My mind's just bouncing around. My body's uncomfortable. I'm not getting anything out of this. Why should I spend the time? And you just can't look at it that way. You really have to look at it as a long-term investment of your energy in a direction that over time builds cumulatively to really a big transformative shift. But you have to be patient and, and dedicated. Yeah, to move that over. You know, in your book, Breathing Love, you talk about temptations and desires. Just kind of piggyback on that a little bit. And love being in disguise, what does that mean? Mm. Well, we are, as humans, very driven by desire. Um, it's obvious. In From the moment we wake up in the morning, we're thinking about what we want to eat or drink or do or not do. And mm-hmm. so this um, kind of continual desire that draws us through our day and Certainly the desire to feel that that personal emotional uh, high of love that we get when we're in a, a new relationship or an infatuation can be very, very tempting. That is a, just an amazing pull for some people, um, for most people, I should say. Mm-hmm. And we have to recognize that that is not the thing to follow because it's not going to take us to the 
um, that eternal sense of love that is Mm -hmm. unconnected, again, from the personal fluctuating people and circumstances of our lives because people are not always going to deliver the love that we are needing in the moment that no one, you know, you don't have to be more than 10 years old to know that. Um, (laughs) Anyone who's ever been in a relationship knows that "Mm, that other person is definitely not going to always give you what you need. So we can't look to the other as our source of love. And so a big concept in this book is that we have to reconnect to the source with a capital S, the big self or source of love, which is the divine essence, the divine energy that is um, that is what is all of this universe that we're in. And, mm-hmm. you know, some people call that God, some people call it spirit or love. I call it love because that's how I, I most... Um, understand it and love is this harmonizing principle it's what brings us back together it's what brings us into unity within our own beings and it's also what brings us into unity with others and unity doesn't have to mean relationship it just means connectivity and harmony yeah and and being in that that place where you're feeling you know it doesn't have to be like loving all the time where some people misidentify it's just that place of peace Exactly. Just a place of peace and a place of compassion. Um, I was standing in a checkout line the other day in a supermarket. It was a busy time of year. Everybody's gathering their things. It was a Sunday afternoon. I don't know why I went in. Um, <laughs> and this man um, stepped in front of me and placed his things on the on the um, checkout thing in front of in front of me. And I had a moment of sort of being taken back, like really? He just stepped in front of me and put his things down. And, and I just thought, and then I noticed that he had one eye that was partially closed and the other eye looked a little bit affected. So I wondered if maybe he had was partially blind and he couldn't judge distance or he didn't see that I was there. I I didn't know Mm -hmm. exactly what was going on for him, but it just, it was like, because of my my practice that helps me to be non not as reactive, I won't say non reactive because I certainly have my moments, but um, <laughs> meditation helps me to be less reactive. I I had just that moment where I was like, huh, this is interesting. I didn't go immediately to what a jerk. I just thought hmm, this is interesting. He put his things down in front of me, and then that gave me that just that moment of pause where I actually looked at him. I recognized he had a, a disability and I had compassion for him. And so instead of um, speak harshly to him about his action, I struck up a conversation about one of the items that he was buying that I really liked as well. And we had a nice little interchange. And um, as it turns out, I, I went in my rightful place in the line without any objection from him. And But even if I hadn't, it wouldn't have made a big deal, you know. It was was just one of those sweet moments of connectivity. So to your point of the loving that we're talking about in this um, talk today is not that big romantic emotional love. It's just Mm -hmm. that kind, compassionate, like we're all in this together, people. Let's, (laughs) Let's just love each other a little bit more. Yeah, for sure. And, and you know, it's so funny when things like that happen, whether it's in line, because the lines, you know, you know, pretty much through the new year are all long, you know, so it, it, it's fine. Or if it's in traffic or whatever the case is, you know, it really gives us the opportunity to show people who it is that we are, you know, as opposed to reacting. It's like, are, are we showing up as a compassionate, loving person that, you know, it, it if we have five more minutes added to our schedule, is that really going to shift our earth, you know? Yeah. And we also have to remember that we have no idea what their story is. And the practice of um, just recognizing that the person in front of us may have something really difficult going on, and that's why they're being impatient. Um, maybe they have a loved one who's in the hospital or maybe they're ill themselves or maybe they're alone at the holidays and feeling really out of sorts. So it's just, it, it, it's just the best thing that we can do to take a breath of love, take a breath of patience and not move into judgment. 
not move into reactivity, but actually move into recognition that this other being in front of us has their own story too. And it's, it's okay. Well, you know, and on, you know, kind of to segue on this topic a little bit, you know, so what are some of the ways that we can practice love on a daily basis in our life? Well, certainly what we've just been talking about, patience, I think, um, that, that was definitely up during the holiday season, but we, I think we have the opportunity to be patient all the time. Um, non-judgment is another way of practicing love on a daily basis. And that's a big one. <laughs> you, that's a huge one. And if you or any one of us were to watch and keep track of our thinking mind throughout a day, we would recognize pretty quickly that we are in constant judgment. I like this. I don't like that. I want that. I don't want that. And so we're, we're just categorizing and judging as good, bad all mm-hmm. throughout our day. And to practice not doing that, but just to be in a more neutral mind um, is a very powerful practice of loving, in my opinion. Um, because it moves us back to that place of evenness and stillness in ourselves rather than the bouncing ball of up, down, good, bad. And yeah. in that still place, that's where we can tap back into those qualities of love and compassion in our hearts. Um, another way is forgiveness, because certainly we, we all make mistakes. People are going to do things that hurt us either unintentionally or sometimes, sadly, intentionally. But we are responsible for our experience after the fact. And we can either hold on to resentment and be really angry and upset people and then perpetuate that energy out in the world, or we can choose to forgive. And to me, forgiveness is another word for love. Absolutely, because it brings us back into harmony with the state of love within our own being. It's not about actively creating a loving relationship with that other person, because sometimes that's not appropriate if they're somehow not good for our well-being. But Mm -hmm. it's about bringing ourself back into harmony with love internally. And I love how you said that, because, you know, it really addresses... What if we have somebody who's abusive or somebody who's, you know, um, just doesn't have our best interest at heart? It still allows us to, you know, you know, kind of meet them where they are and not be in judgment. But we don't also have to be forced to interact with these people either. Absolutely. Personal boundaries are important, especially if there's a safety issue involved. Um, We absolutely need to be self-honoring in that way and be discerning about who is safe for us to be around emotionally, physically. Um, But where people get really stuck is in the hatred or the fear um, Mm -hmm. around that other person. And so, again, the forgiveness process is not for the other person so much as it is for ourselves and for freeing ourselves. And then we, that also enables us to make clearer choices about the relationships that we invite into our lives or not. That's such a big deal. I, I think, you know, just about everyone at one point or another has gone to a place where, you know, maybe it's, um, you're at a place where it's tough to forgive somebody, even if they've, let's say they've done unforgivable things, you know? Mm-hmm. Well, there's a lot of injustice in the world. Humans do not always treat humans well. And um, in my opinion, uh, the only way that someone can harm another person is because they are so deeply in their own ignorance of their loving nature. And the more we connect with our own loving nature, the less apt we are to harm anyone else. And so when we look out into the world and we see examples of people doing violent or abusive things, um, we can recognize those people as being deeply, deeply in ignorance of their their 
divine nature. And we can pray for them. We can pray yeah. for their souls and their awareness, their consciousness to come back to a greater awakening to love. Yeah, and, and move it back into at least right energy, you know. So mm-hmm. that's a that's a tough one. Well, I mean, you've got so many wonderful points in your book. I'm I'm you know trying to pick all the ones that I love, and I know we'll we we'll probably will never have enough time to you know answer all my questions here. <laughs> the book was so profound; it had so many great points in moving into a more loving state. And I think that's kind of where people really want to live. Well, they do. They don't know that they do, but sometimes, but they do. Mm -hmm. We all do because it is our innate nature. And so when we're disconnected from ourselves, we feel out of joint. Um, It's like when our, our health, our, our, maybe our weight is out of balance or we're not eating well and we know it. So we just feel off. Our energy feels off. When we're not aligned with love, we feel off. And so people might not be able to articulate that this is what they want, but I do believe that it is a universal desire for all of us to be, to come back to alignment with our own inner energy of love. And, um, I'm not sure where I was going with that next it, statement, that's okay. but <laughs> keep, you know, and, <laughs> it, yeah, hey, that's okay because I mean I've got questions here. <laughs> well, and it's interesting because when we talk about love and we talk about things such as ego, a lot of times people have a you know kind of this split on whether they can overcome their ego. Or are they supposed to make friends with it? You know, how can they use this to get to love? Oh. That's an interesting question, Marianne. I like that. <laughs> that little twist on that. How can we use the ego to get to love? That is a that is a very interesting one. Because or I would it, say, just, you know, a lot of times people are like, "Well, I'm not quite sure what to do with my ego. Am I supposed to befriend yeah. it? Am I supposed mm-hmm. to separate from it? You know, how how do we get from from where we are to where we want to be? Yes. So there's. Um, a chapter on the ego self mm-hmm. and the higher self. And, the, and so firstly, it's really understanding the two and their relationships. So the ego self to me is the personality. It's the unique vessel that I'm in, the um, qualities that uh, or skills that I have that are unique to me and different from you. And, and um, so the, to me, the ego is, is a vehicle. It's a necessary vehicle that we're here to use. We, meaning our souls, our Mm -hmm. higher essence or self. And so there's a yogic teaching in the Bhagavad Gita that says that we are meant to put the ego in service to the soul. So that makes a lot of sense to me because we really can't get rid of the ego. As long as we're in a human body, we there is an ego involved. Um, well, that being said, master, mass, truly enlightened masters can embody and not be bound by the same principles of the ego that the average person experiences. But let's say for the majority of us, um, as long as we're in a human body, we have an ego. It's a, it's a unique vehicle that we're meant to use in service to our souls. So it's about understanding what is our soul here to do. And I believe our souls are here to love and to be loved and to express love in every way possible. And so how do we use the ego to get to love was the other half of your question, which is interesting Mm -hmm. because typically we are using our ego to get love. And it's all about that ego journey. And that's back to the desire temptation question. But that's when it's on its own and it's like running rampant. It's like a car without a driver and it's just going willy nilly all over the freeway. Mm -hmm. And that's not going to get us to the true um, experience of that deeper love. So we have to bring the ego into service to the soul by recognizing uh, that what we're here to experience is really that soul level love. And that is much less connected to our personal desires 
and much more connected to that universal sense of loving all beings more unconditionally and with the recognition that we are all part of the same unified whole at the highest level. See, I knew I was asking the right person that question. (laughs) Because, I I mean, I know it it probably wasn't an easy question because a lot of times people are just kind of a little, get a little confused with all of that. But I love how you answered it because it's so true. You know, sometimes the ego needs to be in service, you know, and sometimes it, it can't be that runaway car, you know. Yeah, yeah. But it's something that we have to check at every turn because, mm-hmm. boy, the ego is a crafty, <laughs> crafty creature. <laughs> and it'll work for its own little agendas all the time. Um, yeah. Uh, I'm so grateful for the, the yogic teachings that I have in my background. Uh, my first book, you and I talked about it, True Yoga, mm-hmm. is based on the yoga sutras. And um, there's such timeless teachings in terms of how to work with things like this. And one of the, one of the sutras talks about um, practicing contentment. And so that one's powerful because it speaks to the moving out, moving back into neutral mind and out of the like, dislike, want, don't want. Because we're, if we're not always working for our own agenda, then we're more apt to be that embodying that love that I'm talking about and breathing love, which is uh, so much bigger. And it's such a spacious place to live and breathe and walk around in. Um, the, The egos, when it's on its own agenda, is very constrictive. Uh, And I think everyone can understand this from the standpoint of, you know, when you're thinking about what I want, I, me, mine, these are small, constrictive places that we get in. And if we don't get what we want, then we're upset and then we just close down or we start to manipulate and it just doesn't feel good. Mm -hmm. Being self-centered doesn't feel good. Although, at first, it might seem like it is. It really isn't. Being selfless, thinking about others, actually feels so much better. There is an expansiveness of joy that comes with selflessness that is beyond description until you experience it. And I'm talking about even the simplest little things. One thing that came up for me yesterday, yesterday was my birthday, and um, oh. I had a free drink at Starbucks. Yay. So I went mm-hmm. to get the, I was thinking, well, uh, my husband said, you should get the biggest thing, you know, you love some special thing. And so I got in the drive through line, and he wasn't with me, and I, I just thought, you know what, I don't even want it. I want to get him one. So I got him his favorite big drink and brought it home on my birthday. But that made me happy. It made me much happier than getting the big drink for myself. So, <laughs> so little example, but yeah, well, do you know what, but it's, it, those little build. examples make such a big difference because, you know, and you brought up this earlier, we never know the journey someone else is going through, you know, and, and just the upset and just the pain that people go through. So little things like that, make such a big difference in somebody else's day. Absolutely. And, you know, the other thing that makes a huge difference in people's day is just letting them know that you're thinking about them. Um, I often will just think of someone and I'll just send them a text and I'll say, hey, I'm thinking about you and just sending you a big hug or sending you love. Hope you're doing good. It may be an old friend or a, a current friend, but somebody that I haven't been in touch with much. And I'll tell you, almost every time somebody will say, wow, I really needed that today. Or that's amazing. I was just thinking of you too the other day. Or, you know, so we really are connected and we can make such a difference in one another's journey. You know, life is hard. Life is kind of hard. There's a lot of challenges to being human. And there's no human life that gets away with – an easy road all the time. And so we can make that load lighter for one another with these little kindnesses. 
It's so important. It really is. And, you know, it kind of leads me to kind of my next question um, for you here because, I mean, we talked about ego. We talked about love, you know, on a daily, you know, having a daily practice of love in our lives. You know, and I, what I hear a lot of times from people is that they want to have a deeper connection with God or source. And so what are some ways they can start to integrate that into their lives if they feel like they're struggling with that part? Well, just wanting it is the first step. Um, I think a lot of people have gotten a bad uh, impression of what the divine or God is through maybe something they were told when they were young or some experience in an organization that they didn't really jive with. And so it's important to want that first, to come back into the desire to know your source um, because that leads us then to seek it out in all different ways. And to me, source is reflected all around us all the time. In every aspect of manifestation that we see, I see God. And so sometimes that's really beautiful, and sometimes it presents not so beautiful. And the challenge is to see the divine within even the part of the creation that are not presenting a very beautiful exterior, um, you know, somebody who is maybe being really acting very violently or, or meanly, um, very hard to see a good divine essence in that. But I believe that it is there behind that mask. And so my job is to really see beyond the mask, to see back to source. And what helps me to to remember to do that or to remember to try to do that is my meditation practice because it's only when I can drop my personal analytical processing judging mind for a few minutes and I can judge, I can drop all of my emotional waves of um, whatever I might be feeling about this, that or the other thing going on in my life. I can drop all that and just go into the really the that still place it's there that I meet source I feel the love and so I know that it is the essence of creation and I can't then look at anything in creation and not see it I it sometimes it's a little fuzzy because of that disconnect that that other being may have but I have to mm-hmm see beyond the fuzz back yeah. to the the truth and just feel your way through it and it's interesting when you first for me at least when I, I first started that journey you know um, I was raised Catholic and so it was really difficult for me to have that that close connection and discussion with God because of the way that I was brought up you know so it's always because you have this um, third person that you go to you have a priest or a nun or someone that's kind of talking to God on your behalf. So for me, when I started to go down that path and you know was craving that deeper relationship, it took time to develop that. It didn't just happen overnight, which for some people it probably does, but for me it, it took a little time. I think it takes time for most people. Um, practicing devotion to something that you don't know is hard to do. And yet it is the devotion that brings us into the communion with the divine. So to me, the devotion almost has a, a um, just a discipline aspect to it at first. Like I have to get myself to the cushion every day. I have to carve out that time for stillness. And then once I'm there, I just sit with the with again that desire to know God, the the love, the the hope that I can feel more love coming up from within me, which I know is the divine essence within me. Mm-hmm. And so, but I have to present myself to that practice first, and that's the the devotional side of. Um, and then it feeds itself, though. So, I mean, the disciplinary side. And then it feeds in, it feeds the devotion because the, we feel a little bit of the love bubbling up or the joy mm-hmm. or the peace bubbling up in meditation. Then we want to come back and we get more devoted to the practice and to God. Yeah, and to that whole, 
Yeah, to what it is that we're really looking to cultivate there. Mm-hmm. So I, I know you also discuss in your book, you know, being able to have a non-personal love for all beings. And for some people, you know, we've talked about love in varying degrees. You know, for some people, they may have a hard time with that. Um, or maybe not feel like they can feel love for, you know, for animals or, you know, plants or what have you. I understand that. A lot of people will will read a teaching like that and have a hard time with it, not understand it, not feel like it's something that they can or want to um, practice. Mm-hmm. And I can only speak from my own experience, which is that the more I cultivate the 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 engagement with love um, because I don't have to cultivate love itself. I believe love is is always there within. So it's the engagement with it. It's the recognition of it. The more I cultivate that through my meditation practice and through all the ways that I offer um, qualities like patience or compassion to people I interact with, the more I cultivate that, the more I I feel an expansion of love to all beings and I can recognize the divine in all beings. So even in beings that I do not agree with, whose actions I vehemently oppose, and we won't talk politics and we don't have to Mm -hmm. talk about the negative news out there, everyone can identify with some personality that they vehemently disagree with. But I can still recognize within that, that soul the seed of love, and that's what I choose to focus on when I think of them. I choose not to focus on hatred or fear or disagreement. I'm actively making a choice to see them in light, see them as the divine essence that they are. And then I may, on the outside, choose not to vote for them or choose mm-hmm. to um take a, an action to oppose something that they're fighting for, but that's different. That's different than the inner practice of not letting myself go into the energy of hatred or separatism because that doesn't help me. It doesn't yeah. help anybody. Yeah, and, and really be able to be in that place where it's a little bit more um, kind of, it's it just a, a more of a loving space. Mm-hmm. Ultimately, we practice love, we breathe love because it feels good. It's mm-hmm. good for us. It's, it's what's going to bring us into the greatest harmony within our own being. I, that's how I keep coming back to the practice because of all the varying forms of spiritual practice that I've undertaken in my life and all the various philosophies I've read about and studied, this is the nugget, the the real essence that I have to keep coming back to. It's what keeps pulling me back. And so um, Paramahansa Yogananda, a famous yogi, wrote Autobiography of a Yogi. He says that love is the unifying principle of the universe. And that makes perfect sense to me because it is what draws us back. It pulls us back together into a state of internal unity. We don't feel good when we're bouncing all over in inner conflict. And we all have plenty of that. But we can start to mitigate it through this active practice of loving. And be able to really be more present. Well, and, you know, it kind of leads me to, I think I've got time for maybe one or two more questions here. You know, it kind of leads me to, like, my next question in regards to, you know, just how do we, how can we use breathing love when we're suffering grief and loss? Such a profound time to practice this. Um, I've had a lot of loss in my life, lost a lot of loved ones, um, most recently the loss of my mother. And 
I know that when I could shift myself from the focus on the, the, the lack, the, her decline in health, the, her inability to communicate or recognize me in the same way that she always had. And we had a very beautiful relationship, so that was very hard to watch. Um, and then ultimately her passing. When I could sep- separate my mind from the, the focus on that lack, that loss, and bring myself back to focusing on the love that I felt for her, the love that I wanted her to feel and know and be in, um, the love that I wanted her to recognize within herself, uh, then I felt peaceful. I didn't feel sad. And it's, you know, that might sound really strange to say you don't feel sad about a, somebody you've had a really wonderful relationship with passing. But because there was such a great love between us, and then after her passing, that's what I chose to focus on, I don't feel sad. I just feel, I just feel love. I feel loving mm-hmm. for her. I feel joyful, actually, because I can still feel her love with me. So I don't feel the sense of lack. I feel the sense of of joy. Yeah. Well, and it's interesting when we focus on that love and then realize that spirit is eternal, that this isn't goodbye forever. It's just, you know, I'll see you later. You know, it's not, it's not an end, you know, so to speak. And when we feel that love, we're really, you know, honoring their soul and bringing them more into our lives as well. Right. And so one of the things that we grieve when, when someone leaves our life, it might not even be a death, it might just be the ending of a relationship, but what we grieve is the lack of their presence. We miss them, you know? And so when I start to feel that, um, I felt it the other day on my birthday because who better than your mom to wish you happy birthday. Um, <laughs> but I just shift yeah. it. I really quickly shift into the practice of breathing love and I send her that energy. I send her that intention wherever you are, mom, I love you. I hope you can feel my love. Um, I hope you're doing great. And then I feel her. And so it's this reciprocation within that loving energy that brought me out of missing her and actually back to feeling her present with me in love. Cause I don't, I believe that love never dies that forms change, but that love absolutely never dies. Yeah, I, I agree with you on that because I have, you know, personally been in rooms where, you know, let's say I was working and I could smell a perfume of a loved one that passed and know that they were there with me because it's, you know, it was unlike anything else I had in my home. And so you kind of look at these instances and go, gosh, you know, they're still with us. Absolutely. Absolutely. And the more we tune into them through love and through our intuition, the more we can feel them close to us. Yeah. And have that, that connection and that closeness. Well, and, and my goodness, I mean, your book is, again, so profound, Breathing Love, Meditation in Action, which I love the subtitle, because it really tells people that, you know, it's just not sometimes just sitting there meditating on the mat, but as you were saying, how you can move your meditation practice with you throughout your day. And that's so impactful. Thank you, Marianne. I, I hope it will impact people's thinking and their lives. Um, it's my greatest hope that readers will take comfort from this book and find tools that they can work with. Um, there are prayers, there are affirmations, there are stories, there are exercises, there are guided meditations, um, some short, some long. So there's lots and lots of resources in the book as well as um, discussion of many of the topics that you and I have covered this morning. So I really feel like there's something for everyone to plug into here, wherever they are on their journey. And um, and I always love hearing from people. And if they have questions or they get hung up on something as they're reading, I love receiving emails and hearing what people are responding to or struggling with. And so, What's going on? yeah, well, you know, with all the coaching that you do, what, what do you say is like the number one thing that people reach out to you for? 
Well, I have sort of um, grown a specialty in working with people who struggle with anxiety and depression and stress and grief. Um, Those are the things that people often come in with. And I think Mm -hmm. these are really common for people in the world today. I mean, it's it's a challenging time that we're living in. Um, But beneath those, uh, those presenting conditions is I feel that what people are seeking is a greater understanding of who they really are, why they're really here, what the purpose of life is, what are the spiritual tools that they can use to come into those greater awarenesses for themselves and whether or not they walk in and say all that, usually they don't. But yeah. <laughs> um, I sense that as, because it's, it's what I offer as a coach. It's, it's who I am as a yoga therapist. It's really the overriding um goal that I'm working Mm -hmm. on, regardless of whether I'm just working on somebody with somebody and rehabilitating a physical challenge that they may be going through, or whether maybe it's, um, you know, the condition of feeling really anxious in their life. But underneath all of those more external experiences, our souls are here for a reason. And until we come to a recognition of what that is, we're going to feel a little out of sorts. So there's always that spiritual component in my coaching and um, whether it's stated or not, it's, it's happening and it's always good. <laughs> <laughs> well, I could good see fun. where people, yeah, and, and I could see where people would come to you for those kind of things because I know that you have specialized in helping people overcome stress and anxiety and depression and, you know, we've had the pleasure of talking, um, you know, once or twice and I've always found your insights to be So on target and just appropriate and and just kind of getting people in the right frame of mind, you know? Well, thank you. It's always a pleasure to talk with you as well, Marianne. (laughs) Well, you know, and so Jenny, where can people connect with you and be part of your community? Sure. So I have a website. Um, It's my name, Jenny, J-E-N-N-I-E, Lee, L-E-E, Yoga therapy.com. So Jenny Lee yoga therapy.com. And on there, there's lots of ways they can connect with me. If they want to do personal counseling, that's available. If they want to do maybe an online course or um, do a retreat that I, I always have a retreat coming up. Um, although the next one is sold out, but I'm sure there'll be a new one popping on there pretty soon. So they can just mm-hmm. sign up for the newsletter on the website or they can reach out personally and share something that they're going through or ask for a consultation. I offer um, free initial consultations just to see if the personal coaching would be a fit. And um, the book, Breathing Love, Meditation in Action is on Amazon. It should be mailing out very soon. I think it still shows it as pre-order, but it's um, just about to mail out. So um, very exciting times, yeah. I swear. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. and I know, I know from my personal experience with you that people don't need to be right in the Hawaii area because you work with people all over the world. I do. So the beauty of technology is that we can connect wherever we are. I travel a lot and I know people have clients in the UK and Europe and all over the States and Canada. So Skype, FaceTime. It all (laughs) works. works. (laughs) It all works. Yeah. Yeah, we we do live in a great age. Well, you know, Jenny, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show with us here today. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure, and I wish you just the happiest new year and hope it's all great and filled with um, lots of breaths of love. Thank you, Jenny. Wishing you and everyone a very happy 2018. I know this year is going to be fabulous for everybody, and I am so excited that we are just starting it off, especially talking about your great book. So we're at the end of our time today. I'd like to thank everyone for tuning in. You've been listening to Moments with Marianne. And remember, make every moment count. In a 
single moment, your life can change. Moments with Marianne is a transformative hour that covers an endless array of topics with the best of the best. Her guests are leaders in their fields, ranging from inspirational authors, top industry leaders, and business and spiritual entrepreneurs. Each guest is gifted and a true visionary, a recognized leader in her own work, and while teaching others to develop, refocus, and grow, Marianne will bring the best guest and sometimes a special surprise. Don't miss this. You never know just which moment will change your life forever. Moments with Mary Ann airs every Thursday, Friday, and Sunday at 8 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Mountain Time. Make sure to tune in and visit momentswithmaryann.com for more information.